Hi and welcome to Extra Maths. My name is Lee, it's good to be with you. Today we're going to start looking at an extremely important section, one that happens in your paper one, but it is such a powerful section of work, it's called calculus, in that you'll find that if you're going to study on in any field, this is going to be the mathematics that is extremely useful to you, as I say, in just about every field we, we work on. Anyhow, we need to start first of all by looking at some of the basics behind calculus. So initially, it's a pretty boring section because all you've got to do is learn techniques and approaches. And unfortunately, you do get asked these. They're considered the basics of it. So let's have a quick look at what basics we need to put in place and then we can take them one by one and address them. Right, let's have a look. As I say, the section is called calculus and there are key concepts. And the first key concept is functional notation. Then it's average gradient, then it's limits, then finally we get to derivatives from first principles. Now this word is a new word to you, but don't worry, we'll make more sense of it later on. Then derivatives from rules. By the way, before we move on, first principles, what would that mean to you? Well, if I say first principles, I mean from the very basics of the section. So using very definition-based approaches. But we will go back to that and spend much more time on it later on. Right, and then the last thing we're going to look at today is tangents to a curve. But let's start first of all addressing the first of these sections, and that is functional notation. You have met functional notation through your entire school career. Believe it or not, the teachers might not have used that name, but I'm sure you've seen it in several different ways. The first way you would have met it is probably quite early in your grade nine year, where you were told about something called a function machine. And what this function machine basically did is you would put in an x value, some kind of equation would happen to it, so let's call it f, and out would pop a y value. And then this would form a coordinate x, y. Right, so let's talk about it. What's going to be different to what we've been doing before? Well, very little, except maybe what we're going to call these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to input our x as before. f is going to happen to it and out is going to pop f of x. In other words, the coordinate will take the form of x, f of x. And I'm sure you remember from last year when you were doing your grade 10 um, graphs, the teacher would have said to you, you know, we could call the y-axis f of x, or let's call this equation f of x. And basically, f of x and y are interchangeable. It's just a functional notation way of doing it. So what does that mean? Let's have a look at a, perhaps a little bit of an example here. Say, for example, f of x equals x squared plus x minus 7. Well, what am I saying to you? I'm saying let's have our little function machine going over here. Let's plonk an x in here. When it goes in, it'll be squared, add it to itself, and then subtract 7, and out will pop my f of x or my y. So if I now change the color of my pen so we can see, let's say I'm going to prompt a 1 in there. So 1 is going to go into the machine. It's going to be 1 squared plus 1, which is 2, minus 7, which gives me minus 5. And so we have the coordinate 1, negative 5. Or if you like, I could have written 1, f of 1, because the f of 1 is equal to minus 5. Now I could have taken another value, so let's take... Uh, let's take a negative value. Let's put in minus 3. Okay, so I'm going to plug my minus 3 into here. And I'm going to go along here and I'm going to say minus 3 squared plus negative 3 minus 7, which is going to give me 9 minus 3 minus 7, which is 9 minus 10. 9 minus 10 gives me negative 1. So that means that the f of minus 3 is negative 1. So in actual fact, the coordinate is minus 3 for x, minus 1 for y. So as you can see, very simple and straightforward. And this whole concept can also be carried onto our graphs. So if we are drawing ourselves an axis, let's use the one with the arrow so it looks nice. Oh, that's a lovely straight line, isn't it? Let's straighten it up. 
so much for straightening it up. There you go, that's fine. And we are going to call this axis x, and we're going to call this axis the f of x, because we've established that y equals f of x. Now, if I'm drawing a graph, any old graph I feel like, I could say over here I have x, and over here I have f of x. Ah, now I'm writing beautifully. Now let's suppose I've got a over here. Then over here would be the f of a. So that would be a, f of a. Okay, so that's quite a simple concept. Let's see how this is going to relate to our calculus. So as I said, it's a concept we, we know of. But basically, this is going to be taken much further within our calculus. So let's go to the next page and let's look at some examples of it. It's talking functional notation and they give me an equation. f of x equals x squared plus x minus 6. And the first question says, find the f of 2. Well, literally, it's glorified substitution. It's telling me wherever there's an x, put a 2. So let's just do that. We go over here, and where there's an x, we go 2 squared plus 2 minus 6. Well, 2 squared is 4 plus 2 minus 6, which, if we add up, gives us 0. So we know that this would be the coordinate 2. And I think my semicolon there looks more like a splodge. So let's just write that again. Uh, this is going to be 2, 0. Okay, quite easy. As I say, we could have written 2, f of 2, because the f of 2 is 0. Right, let's look at the next one. We're still using the same graph. We're using f of x equals x squared plus x minus 6. And we're going to go this time, and wherever there's an x, we're going to put minus 1. So it's minus 1 squared plus negative 1 minus 6 which is minus 1 squared is 1, minus 1, minus 6, and so the answer is minus 6, and so we know that's giving me the coordinate minus 1, minus 6. Okay, really straightforward, really easy, something you've done before. It's not a huge problem for you, but all I want you to start doing in your mind is thinking of it as a coordinate. This is quite useful when we get going later on in explaining some of the new concepts that are going to come up this, this time. Right, so let's move on to the next one. Now I'm going to make it a little bit more abstract. I've got f of a, and my equation is still f of x equals x squared plus x minus 6. I'm just going to bring it down here so we can bring the page up a bit and we can see more clearly. So right, the f of a, there it is. So we're going to go along wherever there's an x, we're going to put an a. So it's a squared plus a minus 6. And so we have a coordinate a a squared plus a minus 6. And that's quite nicely done. Okay, it doesn't look so nice. It doesn't look like a real sort of number, but it's expressed in terms of A, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. All right, now when does it get difficult? It gets difficult when we decide to change this thing in the bracket using an x in it. So the very next example we look at is where things start to become a little bit unclear. Up to now, not unfamiliar ter territory, even that a, you might have even seen that before. And even this next one, you might have seen it before, but you'll probably find the teacher just gave you a little taste of it and then moved on because we know that conceptually it's quite hard to think like this. I want you to think of this thing here as a package. Let's bring it right up here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going to this equation and I'm saying the package goes in here and we square it. Then the package goes in here and then I subtract 6. And the package, according to this, will be x plus 1. x plus 1. I don't know if this pen's an ideal one, so let's stick to the blue one. Right, so now I'm telling you I have to square x squared plus 1. Well, we know that that means x plus 1 times x plus 1. Be very careful here. It's very easy to fall into the trap that if you've got that, you think to yourself it's x squared plus 1. But that's not true. And so it's very important that you think about it. Just think to yourself, if I had 2 plus 3 and I'm squaring it, do you agree 2 plus 3 is 5 and 5 squared is 25? If I just did that, I get 2 squared plus 3 squared. 2 squared being 4 and 3 squared being 9, which is 13, which is clearly not equal to 25. 
So we have to be very careful about this when we do it. So just remember, if you're not sure and you don't remember it, write it out twice, and then you know how to use your first, your outers, your inners, and your lasts. But if not, then what you do is you just write it twice, or you use a shortcut that it looks like this. It goes as follows. It says, if I've got x plus 1 squared, I square the first one, which is x squared. I square the last one, which is plus 1. I multiply those together, gives me 1x, and then I times it by 2. And if I times it by 2, I'm going to put in plus 2x. Now that is obviously a preferred method, because the preferred method here would be quick and easy. But I only believe in doing shortcuts when it's not a danger that you're going to go wrong. So if you are scared of that, rather do this. The first times together is x squared. The outers will be plus x. The inners will be plus x. And my lasts will be plus 1. I've still got this here, plus x plus 1, there's nothing to do there, minus 6. So that's plus x plus 1 minus 6. Right, so now all that remains is for us to add up the like terms and to get this in a more precise or concise formula. So let's have a look. If I go over here, let's just get myself onto a pen. I have got x squared, and I see I've got 1, 2, 3 x's. And I've got 1 minus 6 plus 1, so that's going to give me 2 minus 6, which gives me minus 4. So right, let's just check. It's x squared, 1, 2, 3x. 1, 2, minus 6, minus 4, that all looks good. So our coordinate would be x plus 1, colon, x squared plus 3x minus 4. So right, it's, it's a relatively straightforward, simple way of doing this functional notation. And I'm sure you're feeling pretty confident that you're able to remember that and do it. The only way I can make this even a little bit harder is to introduce a second variable. So you know what, I haven't got an example like that here, but let's put one up and let's have a look at it. So let's call this number 5. And let's suppose I'm looking at the f of x plus h. Now remember what I said to you, I said this is the package I'm going to put into the equation. So what have I got? I've got something squared plus something minus 6. Right, so the something is going to be x plus h, x plus h. Because as I've said to you, this is just glorified substitution. And so all we're doing is we're taking whatever it is and we're putting it in there and we're simplifying whatever the expression says. So let's go and do it. So that's equal to. Let's do the shortcut on this this time. So we square the first, it's going to be x squared. We square the last, so it's going to be plus h squared. We multiply those together so we get xh. And if we double that, it's 2xh. And then we've got plus x plus h minus 6. Right, now if we look at this, there are no like terms. So in actual fact, I could stop it off right there. Or maybe I could shuffle them a bit and make them look a bit different. But I really think it's probably fine to stop there. So what I would do now is I'd write the coordinate x plus h, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus x plus h minus 6. Quite a mouthful, but it is a coordinate. That's your x value. That's your y value. Right, so let's move on now to the second concept we need to know about. And that is the concept of average gradient. Now, average gradient you have been taught since your grade 9 year, believe it or not. The teachers have been sneaking it in here and there, especially amongst the graph interpretation. Because we knew calculus was coming, and we knew there was a good idea that you formed a concept really early on this. So let's go and have a look at what that concept should be. Now the word itself, average, is very, very, very deceptive. Because you think average, it's like taking your two marks, adding them together and dividing by two. That would be an average. Well, this is a bit different in the sense that it almost should be used, the word approximate. Now you might say to me, why approximate? Well, what we're going to do here, let's get ourselves an axis first of all, so we can talk about the actual purpose of this. So here's an axis. Uh, what we're actually doing here is we're taking some curve, any shape, any size, any proportion, and we are going to say, let's assume there's a point over here, let's call it x1, and let's call a point over here x2, and we're saying, okay, let's put a line through those two points. And we're then saying, let's work out the gradient of this line. Let's make it a highlighted line. 
Now, obviously, this line approximates the gradient of the curve. Now, do you agree with me? With a curve, you won't have a fixed gradient. With a straight line, our gradient is always constant. But if we've got a curve, the gradient will be changing depending where we are. So if we look across at this graph here, we can see that over here the gradient will be fairly steep. And then it will narrow down as we head this way. But you agree with me, all the way along here, if I put points in, the gradient would be negative. And on this side of the graph, all along here, the gradient will be positive. So the one I've put in here is definitely a positive gradient. And you can see that the reason I'm calling it an approximate or an average gradient is because there is that much of a gap between my graph and the actual line I'm finding the gradient of. So right, what do we need to know about gradient? Well, we've been working with gradient, as I say, literally since grade nine, where we talk about the change in y over the change in x. Now, I'm gonna stress that notation because it's actually quite important when we get to some of the notations for our rules, where I will start using that symbol and you'll think, now, where did she come with that? So let's mention it now. Our gradient is determined by looking at the change in y over the change in x. Now change is used by the symbol that, which is actually delta, which is the Greek letter for D. Now you'll say, well, what do, what do we care about this at this moment in time? And I would answer you very little, but you're gonna see when I start working with the notations, and I'm gonna tell you a very interesting story about how calculus came about and what sort of impact it had in the very early stages of calculus and why we now sit with a legacy of lots of different notations to learn. But you'll see as we go. Right, so what I mean by change in y? I mean, let's take y2 minus y1 and divide it by x2 minus x1. And of course, you will know that as the gradient formula you've done in your analytical geometry from grade 10. And in fact, grade 9, you would have used it to find the equations of straight lines. So it's not a new concept to you at all. Now, let's talk about what I was talking about earlier. Remember, I talked to you about this point being x2, y2, but I said to you, if we felt like it, and I think we do feel like it, we could call this x2, f of x2. My x2 there is not doing too well, so let's just write it again. f of x2. When I was in matric, my math teacher made me work in pencil. He used to say it looked like a spider had got drunk, fallen into a pot of ink and crawled across the page. So I'm trying really hard to write nicely. Right, so let's go over here to this point here, and we've got x1, and using that same concept, instead of going y1, I could go x1, f of x1. All right, so there again, I could be using this functional notation, which means I could go over here and say my gradient is the f of x2 minus the f of x1, over x2 minus x1. Right, so let's take this a little further. And you might say to me, why are you complicating this for us? Well, I'm actually trying not to. I'm trying to make you aware that there's several ways we can write the same expression. And we can get the same thing to work out just by using slightly different notation. So let's have a look at it. Let's draw ourselves another graph. And for a change of scenery, let's make it a different graph. Let's make it a hyperbola. Right, and let's choose some values. So let's choose a point over here, call it x. And this time I'm gonna say, all right, let's move h units this way. Now, if I do that, if this had been one and I said I'm moving three units this way, then what I would be saying is one plus three, which gives me four. So this is gonna be x plus h. Right, so that means now let's put in the line that will be the one I'm looking at the gradient of. So there it is. Remember what we said earlier on, we said this point would be x, f of x, and this point over here would be x plus h, f of x plus h. Right, let's call this x1, y1, and let's call this one x2, y2. Now, as you can see, this line is in a negative shape, so what it would happen when I'd worked it out is I would have found that my gradient, in fact, was a negative. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go along and we're going to work, but it's in abstract, so we won't see that appear. But should we have had values, and we will be doing that at some stage, you will see that that does happen. So right, so average gradient. 
Now, strictly speaking, we should always write average gradient because you agree with me, it's not the actual gradient, it's an approximation of the gradient, would be y2, which is the f of x plus h, minus y1, which is the f of x, and I see I didn't complete that point, over the x2, which is x plus h, subtract that x over there. Now you'll see what happens is I get the f of x plus h minus the f of x all over h. And those of you that have done this section prior to listening to this program will of course realize that that is the, the crux of average gradient and eventually of the gradient from first principles. But I just want to mention it to you now. I don't want those of you who haven't seen it to worry about it. Um, I will explain it as we go and build it into the work. As I say, initially, calculus is pretty boring because it's all these strange concepts we need to get under control. Right, the next concept we need to, well, let's first have a look at some examples before we move on. If I'm looking at average gradient, an example of it would be something like this. They'd say, if f of x equals this curve, determine the gradient of the curve between x equals 1 and x equals 3. Now, of course, we could use any of those complicated formulas I was using at the end. But my advice to you is don't make your life difficult. I'm a great believer. Make it simple. So let's have a look here. Let's say if x is 1, what would the f of 1 be? Well, it would be minus 1 squared plus 3, which is going to be minus 1 plus 3, which is 2. So we have the coordinate 1, 2. Oh, bad coordinate there. Let's draw it again. 1, uh, 1, 2. Ellie wrote negative 2. Right, now I do the same with this one. x is 3, so I'm going to work out the f of 3. So it's going to be minus 3 squared plus 3, which is going to give me minus 9 plus 3, which is equal to minus 6. So we have a coordinate 3, negative 6. Notice I've made no attempt to actually draw this. And you know what, you don't need to. And so, you know, don't make work where you don't have to. If you want to, I'll draw it so you can get a bit of an idea of the perspective. Let's perhaps just knock it out a little graph over here. It would be a parabola, it would be sad, and it would turn it three, so it would look like this. So if I'm looking at between x equals one and x equals three, I could see that my gradient in my line would be a negative answer. But as I said, this is totally unnecessary. You really do not need to do that. It's not uh, essential at all. So now all I would do is I would go over here and I'd say, all right, well, that means that the average gradient, and what I would do now is I'd work out the gradient using those two points. So let's call this one x1, y1, and let's call this one x2, y2. Does it matter which one I use? And the answer is no. I could call the first one two and the second one one. In the end, it works out to the same thing. But once I consistently choose to call this one one, then if it's x1, that must be y1. We can't mix them up. So that's very important. So let's go over here. So y2 is minus 6 minus 2 over 3 minus 1, which is going to give me minus 8 over 2, which is equal to minus 4. So the average gradient is negative 4. Remember what I said to you. If we look over here, we can see it's going to be a negative. But it's not too important to notice that. Hopefully you're accurate enough as it is, and you won't make any errors. All right, let's have a look at one more. What is the average gradient of g of x equals x squared plus 2x between the points minus 1 and 1? Okay, so let's talk about the g of minus 1. If I do that, it's minus 1 squared plus 2 times minus 1, and over here the g of 1 is equal to 1 squared plus 2 times 1. So that's going to be 1 minus 2, which is negative 1, and over here it's going to be 1 plus 2, which is equal to 3. So we have a coordinate minus 1 minus 1, and a coordinate 1, 3. Notice I really like to write those coordinates, it's very useful. And it's always good to have something to refer back to that's nice and neat. So right, average gradient then is equal to, doesn't matter which one we call, so let's call this one x2, y2 this time, just to have a change of scenery, and x1, y1. So y2 is minus 1, subtract 3, over minus 1, minus 1, which is minus 4, over minus 2, which is equal to 2. 
Right, so I didn't draw the graph, so let's just see if this fits in with what we know about the graph. If I drew that graph, it's a smiling parabola. It cuts there, and it cuts there at minus 2. And I said to you it was smiling, so it looks like that. And I'm looking between minus 1 and 1. So minus 1 over here somewhere, and 1 over here. You can see your gradient would be positive if you drew a line through that. So let's just make another color line so you can see it. Okay, you can see clearly that that would have a positive gradient because it's going uphill. All right, so really easy, simple. You'll be amazed how many times, once you've gone through all this calculus, you'll come across a question like this and you'll be thrown by it. But it is so simple. So I'm encouraging you to always remember average gradient is just simply gradient. And it's just an approximation of that curve's gradient. Right, let's move on to the next concept. And the next concept is the concept of a limit. And that is quite a difficult concept. The good news is I can make it really easy for you. But I am going to try to show you at least one where we talk about what it's actually doing. And then after that, I will show you shortcuts and easy ways out of problems. Right, so let's have a look. The concept of a limit. Now, if we look at a limit, it's basically got a... It will takes this kind of shape. So let's put an equation here. I would say, say, x tends to 2 of x plus 1, something like that. Now, those of you that have seen this section before know not to worry about it because, in actual fact, x plus 1 is just a straight line graph. It's continuous, and because it's continuous, I can just substitute the point in. Now, what do I mean by continuous, those of you who don't know it? It means if I went to draw this graph, I could draw it without lifting my pen. So I could draw a straight line like this and not lift my pen. So that would make it continuous. I can draw a parabola like this and not lift my pen. So if there's no problem areas, and I will talk about one now where there is a problem area. So you can see, in fact, I'm going to do two kinds just to show you that the different variations, and then we'll look at some questions. By the way, this, this average gradient question is about five marks, and this is probably about three or four marks. So these are not huge amounts of marks, but unfortunately they do get asked as little easy questions according to the examiners. They're considered basics and they should be in place. So let's have a look at this. What does it mean? What it means is go and draw a graph of y equals x plus 1. Then have a look at what's happening to y. as x approaches 2. Now you might say approaches, what do you mean by that? Well basically let's take the example of losing weight. You go to the doctor and the doctor says, hmm, you've been eating a little bit too many Christmas puddings, you need to lose 10 kilos. So you're very depressed, you go home, you go on a rigorous diet and you really watch what you're eating and you exercise up a storm and you slowly lose the weight. You go to the doctor and you've lost 9,8. Will the doctor shout at you? No, you'll be delighted. You'll think 9.8 is perfectly all right. I asked for 10, 9.8 is good enough. Even if I'd lost 9, the doctor would be quite happy. So basically, it's not important whether I get to that 10 kilos. It's just important, do I get near enough to it to make that difference? Likewise, if I came back to the doctor having lost 12 kilos, I don't think he'd be too worried either. He'd be delighted. He'd think, hmm, that's at least some spare room for the next Christmas cake or whatever. So I, I also want you to think about limits as that. It's an approaching, not an actually getting to it. So let's quickly look at a graph. Let's draw this graph. And we can talk it through. So there's my x, there's my y. I want to draw this graph, so I'm going to go to 1. And remember, if we're drawing this, this m is equal to 1, and my c is equal to 1. So I start there. I go 1 up and 1 across, like that. And so this then becomes my line. Now, what am I asking you? I'm asking you, as x approaches 2, so where would 2 be? Let's see. It's about here somewhere. What is happening to my y's? Well, let's have a look. Let's play a little bit with it. I think let's take this dotted line and see if it works. Well, as I get nearer to that 2, can you see what's happening to my Ys? They're getting nearer and nearer and nearer to a value over here, which happens to be 3. Now, if you drew this graph accurately, you'd be able to just read that off. Okay, obviously I didn't draw it accurately, we're just sort of sketching it roughly. Oh, that's a beautiful straight line. If I look over here, this goes here, and as I go closer to 2 from this side, 
again, I'm heading towards three. So on the one hand, I'm heading towards three from the bottom, and the other hand, I'm heading to three towards the top. And so my conclusion is that the answer for that is three. Now, of course, you'll say, well, what a performance. Surely it was just easy enough to substitute. Yes, it is. And that's what I'm going to encourage you to do. I'm going to show you some examples where we need to do a little bit of cosmetic work first before we do that. So if I go over here, all I would do is I'd say, okay, if x is 2, let's go over here and put in 2. 2 plus 1 equals 3, which is the answer I would have got had I done this graph thing. Okay, let's take it a little further. Let's have a look at what happens if I look at something like this. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2. All right, so if we look at this, first of all, I'm sure you've never drawn a graph that looks like that. Well, if you've done the section, you would have, but um, I don't think mostly you would know. Unless you went and studied some extra math somewhere or perhaps did advanced programming maths or something like that, you would have an idea about this. Okay, so let's have a look at what we would do. We see that we have a problem here. If x would equal 2, what would be the problem? Well, my denominator would equal 0, and we know it may not be that. So in other words, x may not equal 2. But now I'm saying to you, what is the limit at 2? But remember what I said to you, it was the limit as x approaches 2. It's not important that we get to 2. It's just as we approach 2, what is happening to my y values. So let's have a look at how we do draw this. The first thing I would do is I would factorize this. I get x minus 2, x plus 2, because that's the difference of squares, over x minus 2. The good news, that would divide into that, and so I would get x plus 2. So in actual fact, this thing has become a straight line, but with a proviso that x may not equal 2. Right, let's try and draw this, and then we can have a look at what's going on. Right, let's get hold of an axis, and let's start putting it together. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's mark 1, 2, 3, 4, and let's call that x-axis, y-axis, origin. Right, so we're going to plot this. So we're going to 2 over here, and the gradient is 1 up, 1 across. So it goes like this, and let's put in a nice straight line. And that wasn't too straight, so let's just straighten it up. That's the good thing about technology. You can re remedy it relatively easily. Let's bring it in line properly. Okay, so I think that's a pretty good estimation. Now, if we look at this right now, at 2, I know I must have a hole in the graph. So there's a hole there. And if I looked across, I would get the answer 4. Obviously, my drawing's not doing too wonderfully here, but it's good enough. Ooh, I made it a bit too splodged. Let's make it a little less splodged. All right, so there we have it. There's a hole there because, remember, they said to you, x may not equal 2. Now, remember what I said to you. It doesn't matter if it doesn't equal 2. It's as it approaches 2. So if I look from the left side, so let's go and do that, and let's use that. In fact, let me just make sure yeah, I'm on the green one. That's perfect. As I go nearer to the, oh, wrong thing. Let's just pick that up and get rid of it. I obviously decided a circle would look good in the middle of that. So let's go over here, and let's work with that. If I look over here and I bring it up here, I can see that that's not going to work out too nicely. If I go there and across, it's also not too nicely. But as I get nearer to 2, do you agree with me if this thing will let me do it? Then let's change it back to this one. It's getting closer and closer to 4. Likewise, if I go from the other side, let's use the peach one, and I go from this end, closer and closer to my 2, it's also getting closer and closer to 4. So what I know, I know that the answer of this would be 4. Now, you might say, well, how am I going to do that? Because if I try to substitute in 2 immediately, I'm going to get an undefined denominator, and that's true. So what we're going to do is we're first going to do some algebra with it, and then after that, we can actually do the substitution. So let's get some space here and show you how you're going to set it out in a test or an exam. Right, so what we would do here is we'd start over here and we'd say, well, that's the limit as x approaches 2. And this thing here is going to become x minus 2, x plus 2, over x minus 2. The good news is, is that x minus 2 divides into that x minus 2, which takes away our problem area. Remember, if we put the 2 in here, the denominator would have been problematic. However, we're now in a position 
to say, okay, no problem now, we're looking at the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 2. Now you might notice that I have put brackets there. That is extremely important. If you write the limit as x approaches 2 and you go x plus 2, that means do only the limit of that and then add 2. In this case, it wouldn't have made a difference, but it can make a huge difference in some problems. So just remember, we always make use of a bracket around the thing we're finding the limit of. So now all we do is we plug in the 2 and we see that the answer would be 4, which is exactly what would have happened had we done it here. Right, so I think that's enough knowledge on your limits. We can now just go and work with the general kinds that you get in exams and tests. So what I did is I went through some past papers and I dug out four or five examples of what was asked in an examination. So we have a chance to see how they asked. And as I say, they're not huge marks. We're talking two, three, maybe four marks at the most. So let's go over to the questions. Right, the first one says, find the limit as x approaches three of that thing. Well, x tending to three won't cause a problem with a denominator. So in actual fact, that's a straight line. We know it's continuous. We can draw it without lifting the pen. And so all I would do is I put in three there. Three minus three gives me zero. It's as simple as that. Over here, what type of graph is that if I drew it? Y equals five would look like this. Again, it's a continuous graph. So if I substitute x tends to three in here, well, there is no x, my answer would just be five. So, so far, relatively easy. And you can see these wouldn't be major marks, maybe, maybe one mark and one mark here. This one here, maybe two marks, and again, not that bad. We look and we see, ah, oh, it's got a denominator. But we know that a denominator could be problematic if it gives me zero. So if I look over here, if x tends to zero, will this make this zero? And the answer is no, it won't. So in other words, there's nothing wrong with immediately going there and substituting in zero. So it would be zero squared plus six times zero plus eight. So it would just be eight. And at the bottom here, zero plus two, which would just be two. And so my answer is four. So again, very simple, straightforward, no problems with that denominator, so I can just do a substitution. Now this one here would probably be about three or four marks, depending, because this one does cause a problem. They've asked me to look at x tending to minus one. Now if it tends to minus one, can you see that if I put it in there, I'd get a zero? And if I got a zero there, the whole fraction would be undefined. So I have to do some cosmetic changes. So what I do is I do that, and I say, right, let's see what I can do to this top thing. And usually what will happen if you can find the limit is this thing will factorize. And so if it factorizes, we'll be able to get x minus 3, x plus 1, and you can already see there's your problems over. Because at this stage, that x plus 1 divides into that x plus 1. And so what we have now is the limit is x tends to minus 1 of that thing. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to put in minus 1 there. So it's minus 1, minus 3. But before we do that, let's write it again. By the way, there was nothing wrong with not writing it again. I just want to stress again that it's very important if you do write it again, you keep that in brackets. Right, so as x tends to minus 1, it'll be minus 1, minus 3, which is minus 4. And there we have it, beautifully done. Probably if I can give you an idea of how the mark allocation would go, it'd be 1 for factorizing one for sorting and one for there. And if they were generous, they might give you a few more, but definitely three marks would be a comfortable amount of mark allocation. All right, so that's the concept of a limit as far as we need to know it in school. There, are a, there is a lot more to limit concept than what I've shown you. This is just a brief introduction so we can make the leaps we need to make with the different sections. Right, let's moving on. We're now going to talk about differentiation. And you're saying, differentiation, what's that? I've never heard of it. Well, in actual fact, a derivative is a gradient. So when I talk about a derivative, I'm actually talking about the gradient at a point. And I'm sure by now you've realized that I'm very passionate about calculus. I really like this section. And you know teachers, when they really like something, always want to do lots of it and enjoy it. And I enjoy this. It's really good stuff. It's not too exciting at the moment, but you're going to see it's going to be awesome, especially for those of you who do science and biology. You'll see lots of applications that could be used in those subjects. Sorry, it's not biology. It's life science and physical science. All right, let's have a look at this now. 
Right, so what am I talking about? Let's talk about the graph we were working with earlier on. Remember, we were talking about the concept of average gradient. We called this the x-axis, this the y-axis. I had drawn some kind of curve, and it really doesn't matter what curve. Let's make it a parabola again. I had identified an x value over here, say, and a little further on an x plus h. And we had talked about how these points here, that would be the h distance, this point here would be x, f of x, and this point would be x plus h, f of x plus h. Okay, right, and as I said to you, we would have had a um, line going through there, which I'll just get into a little bit more straight line there. Oh no, wrong press. Right, this has decided it doesn't want to give me any help. Yes, there you go. So there it is. And we would say we are talking about the gradient of that when it's average. Now, what is different between what we're doing now and what we have done before is we are now going to introduce the concept of a limit attached to the average gradient. I'm sure you remember me telling you that you could have written the average gradient like this. And I'm sure at the time you were thinking, what is she on about? Well, now the good news is, having done that, I can introduce the limit as h tends to naught. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying this little h value is going to become so, so minuscule that it actually is almost on top of that x. And the moment that happens, let's see what happens to our line. So let's take this line. Let me pick it up again, and uh, let's just move it around a bit. I don't want to pick up the whole thing. I just want the line. Hmm, it's decided it doesn't want to know my troubles, so let's just try again. Okay, don't worry, we'll take another line and we'll play with another line since it's decided it's on strike. So let's put it in over here. Just going to try and draw it sort of on top of that one. Pick it up. Yes, there you go. Now, as we're making the H smaller, do you see what's happening here? Do you agree with me if I moved it a little bit like this? If we looked at it, we could see that if we took this green highlighter, it's cutting there and there. So this distance is smaller than the original distance. Okay, picking it up a little bit more and bringing it in more. What is happening here? I'm sure you're starting to see it very, very clearly. And I'm sure you're saying, oh, I know. I can see what she's on about. So let's see. What is it happening? Well, if you look closely at this, Let's perhaps just clean up that there so you can see a little bit more clearly. And let's just put that blue graph back in again. Oops, not too good. What is happening is this line is becoming a tangent to the curve. Now, in other words, what I'm saying to you is that the gradient of that line is absolutely identical to the gradient of that curve at that point x. Okay, so that's where we're at. So I'm actually saying to you, instead of working with a concept of average gradient, we are working with a concept of the gradient. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take something that you know the answer of already and show you that if I use this definition that I've just written down, in actual fact, I get the gradient. Of course, you would be crazy to get the gradient that way when you can just look at it and give me the gradient. So let's have a look what I'm on about. But before we do that, I want to just for two seconds talk about what we call this thing. So as I say you, this, this is the gradient or the derivative. And what we do is we show a notation like this. It's f dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to naught of f of x plus h minus the f of x over h. This is called finding the derivative from first principles or from definition. Now, let's take a straight line graph because we all know the gradient of a straight line. We just look at it because we know it's in the form y equals mx plus c. We look at the m value. So let's look at one. Let's take y equals 2x plus 1. And as I say, we know that the gradient of this thing is 2. So this is a pointless exercise in a way in that there's no way I'm going to ask you to do this normally. So let's change the notation. Let's write it as f of x equals 2x plus 1. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the f of x plus h. Because notice over here, that's the first thing I have. 
Well, that means go to this expression and wherever there's an x, which is there, put an x plus h. Right, so we have 2x plus 2h plus 1. So we're going to go over here and we're going to replace this thing. Let's do the rest in black so you see what I'm replacing clearly. So it's f dashed x is the limit as h tends to naught. In place of this f of x plus h, just underline it, I can put that. So it's 2x plus 2h plus 1. And I'm then going to subtract f of x, which is that. And then I'm going to put it over h. So it looks like a really complicated thing, but in actual fact it's not difficult. All we're doing is substituting that in, using that functional notation we revised right in the beginning, and now we're going to do some serious cleaning up, because remember it's a limit, and we know that if the limit of h tends to naught, if we put the h equals naught in right now, we would have a denominator that's zero, and we can't have that because then the whole fraction's undefined. So let's go back to it. So we would say the limit as h tends to naught, and then we got 2x plus 2h plus 1 minus 2x minus 1 over h. Now very important at this stage is anything without an h will fall away. If it doesn't, you know you've made a mistake, so that's your check. So this is the limit as h tends to naught of 2h over h. And of course that's wonderful because those h's divide out and we get the limit as h tends to naught of 2. Notice I didn't use the bracket. Remember I kept on stressing to you when you're using limit use a bracket. Now the reason I'm not using a bracket here is I've only got one term. So obviously the limit is the limit of that term. But if you want to and for thoroughness you could put a bracket there, it's fine. Now h tends to naught, there is no h to substitute, the answer is 2. And yes we knew that if this was the equation of a straight line, the gradient was equal to 2. So you can see the parallel very clearly there. Now, as I say to you, it would be a pointless exercise doing the gradient of a straight line this way. But obviously, there is a point when we get to other graphs. So let's go and look at the other graphs. Right, it says they determine the derivative of the following from first principles. So watch for that word. If they don't have first principles or definition there, then you have to use the shortcut. As soon as they have the words first principles or from definition, then you're in a wonderful position of having to go through this whole performance. They do like to ask if they consider it theory because they want to see if you actually understand it or not. And so really, it's a, it's a good, easy question to goose well in. So look at your past papers and see where they've asked it. They wouldn't ask it too often, but it does get asked. And usually it's about four or five marks round about there. But it's easy marks, so don't panic and just be glad that there's some things we can sort of predict and be consistent with. So let's have a look at what I did. The first thing I did is I write the formula down. Now the good news is on your formula sheet, this formula is given to you. But I'm more and more becoming a teacher who believes the formula sheet is a disadvantage. The reason being is by the time you've scratched through all the formulas there and you found the one that you want to use, you've wasted time. So some formulas you use so much that it's actually worth knowing. Some of them you don't use much, and so then it's okay to have to look them up. Also, I would see a formula sheet rather as something where you want to check your formula if you forget, rather than something you rely on totally. So I'm a great believer, put your formula in your head, it just speeds you up first of all, and second of all, you know you're going to use it so many times when you're doing these sections, that it will become something you know. So let's have a look at how we use it now. Now remember what I said to you, you don't have to do this, but I find this a great help. On the side, I would go f of x equals minus x squared plus 4x. And I know this is what will replace this part of the formula. However, I want to work out the f of x plus h, which means wherever there's an x, put an x plus h. So, we have minus something squared plus 4 times something. And the something is your x plus h. Now you can see why I said it was important we looked at those things first of all. Right, so doing that, I'm going to end up with 
minus, and remember we can use the shortcut on this, so it's going to be x squared, and then it'll be h squared. We times these together and double them. And then we've got plus 4x plus 4h. Right, which is minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared plus 4x plus 4h, which is equal to, and basically we can't really take it any further, so that's good enough. So right, let's go to the formula. So f dashed x is equal to, now notice I'm being very thorough about how I write my notation. A big problem with this section is if they're going to ask it and you do the wrong notation, they can take, up, take off up to two marks for notation being incorrect. So one of the biggest mistakes people make is they put the equal sign between the limit and that. So please don't always keep your equal sign to the left of the limit. Always keep your h tending to naught under your limit. And remember, this is the notation we use for derivative. I will talk more about notation just now. So that's the limit as h tends to naught. And in place of f of x plus h, I'm going to go minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared plus 4x plus 4h. And then from that, I'm going to subtract f of x, which is minus x squared plus 4x. And remember, that's all over h. Let's just tidy that minus up a bit. I sort of made a nice splodge there. Right, so now I have the limit as h tends to naught. And I can take these brackets away. So it's minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared plus 4x plus 4h. A minus minus makes a plus x squared. And a minus plus makes a minus 4x. And that's all over h. Now remember what I told you. I said at this stage we can know that we are right because everything left once we've simplified must contain an h. If it doesn't, we know we've made a mistake. We need to go back and fix it up. So let's have a look here. We've got a plus x squared and a minus x squared. We have a minus 4x and a plus 4x. And yes, everything that's left there has got an h in it. So it's the limit as h tends to naught. Now if I look at it, I can take h out as a common factor. So I'm left with minus 2x minus h plus 4 like that over h which is also good news because this will divide into that. And you can see I've got my brackets in the right spot, so I'm not going to waste my time writing it again. I'd rather just go straight to this now and say if h tends to naught, my answer will be minus 2x plus 4. Okay, so before we go any further, what I'm saying to you is f dashed x is minus 2x plus 4. Those of you who've seen it before will know what I'm trying to point out to you here. And those who don't, just have a closer look at it. The minus is still there. Notice that 2 that was there seems to have slipped down there. And this is now x to the 1. And there was an x to the 1 there, but there's no x now. So we're going to see if the next one does the same kind of thing to, for me. And if it does, well, that's wonderful. We're starting to see how we're going to approach our rules. So the good news is, there is a shortcut to this method, but we do need to know this. Right, let's move down to the next example. Right, this next one says, given the function f of x equals 1 over x, determine from first principles f dashed x. Okay? Right, so f dashed x, remember, is the limit, as h tends to naught, of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Okay, now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go on the side here and we're going to say f of x is 1 over x. So let's see what f of x plus h would look like. Now remember what I said to you, it's just a package. And where there's an x, you're going to put an x plus h. So that was really easy. However, what isn't really easy is how we simplify this. So let's have a look at it. f of x plus h is 1 over x plus h. And the f of x is going to be 1 over x over h. Right, let's just highlight a little bit so you can see. So I've replaced this with that. And I've replaced this in place of that. Or if you like here. 
a little bit to highlight it on the actual question. Now, it is a compound fraction or complex fraction. So it's going to require a little bit of, of algebra. Of course, you guys are quite up to it. Just be careful, don't make any errors, and just think logically about how you approach something like this. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to sort out your numerator. So let's do that. Right, so over here I'm going to say the limit as h tends to naught, and I'm going to put it over a common denominator of x, x plus h. Notice at the bottom I still have my h hanging around there. So don't think I've sort of turfed it out the door. I haven't. So that I'm going to have is 1 times x, and over here I'm going to have 1 times x plus h. Right, so that's equal to the limit as h tends to naught. And at the top here I've got x minus x minus h over x, x plus h. And remember, it is still over that h. Right, now at this stage we can see that if we want to, we can see that that x and that x fall away. And so we have the limit as h tends to naught of minus h over x, x plus h. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, that's over 1, so let's times it by 1 over h, which is very good news because those h's divide out. And I now have the limit as h tends to naught of minus 1 over x, x plus h. Now at this stage, if I substitute in h equals naught, would my denominator give me 0? Well, let's see. If I put in 0 for h, no, it wouldn't. It would give me minus 1 over x times x, or if you like, minus 1 over x squared. Hmm. OK, so that's what I'm concluding. And remember, my original read this. Now, I just want to show you something quite interesting. Do you agree with me from exponents? I could call this x to the minus 1. And I could now write this one as minus x to the minus 2. Now, have a look there. That minus 1 has gone in front. And this was minus 1, and I subtracted 1 to give me minus 2. So we're heading towards the shortcut for this. OK, so basically, uh, limits, or rather, should I say, derivatives from first principles, not a difficult concept. We're using a definition that is provided in our formula sheet. We're being careful to implement our substitutions correctly. We're collecting our like terms. We're careful with our algebra. And it's really a reliable way to get some marks. All right, let's move on to rules. Now, differentiation from rules, I've already started to show you a little bit about that indirectly, but there are five different rules. But before we start that, I want to stop for a little bit and just talk to you about why we are going to have so many notations. When calculus was first designed, it was designed in an era where we didn't have, like we have now, internet and fast-moving mail and jet aircrafts and things like that. And so what mathematicians of the time used to do is they would work out their bits of maths and then they would send it to another respected mathematician to verify it. And what happened was there were two people working on this section. That was Newton, who you'll know from science, and Leibniz, who was more of a philosopher than a scientist as such, although he came up with some really good mathematics. Now, what happened was Newton had done something, and he had posted it off by snow mail, like on a ship, across to Leibniz to let him have a look at it. During that time, Leibniz had developed much the same kind of thinking, but Newton believed that he had stolen his work. And so the two men became arch enemies. They really hated each other with a vengeance. And in fact, it is rumored that on Leibniz's death, Newton danced on his grave. So, you know, I know that mathematicians are generally quite eccentric, but you can see that when we, when we work with this, both men had very valuable contributions to make to the subject. And so, unfortunately for us, because then there was a break in the communication between them, the notations developed were very different for each of them. So I'm going to stop for a few minutes. I will go back to notation again and show you three main notations. The first one is the one I've already introduced you to, where we talk about, and let me just take this away because I don't want to actually get into the rules yet. I first want to mention the notations. We talk about if we have f of x, then the derivative is f dashed x. 
nice comfortable notation, simple. The only thing that could get a little confusing is you might get confused between that and that. Remember that is the notation for an inverse. So that is the notation for a derivative. You'll find I use that one quite a lot because it's a simple one to work with. The next one is if I'm talking about y, I talk about the derivative as dy dx. Now you might remember when I was talking about a gradient earlier on, I talked about the change in y over the change in x. And I told you that this was the Greek symbol delta, which would be the letter D. And so you can see clearly where the dy dx came from. There it is. And the third one we're going to work with is a big D with a little x of f of x. Now what this notation is saying is differentiate f of x with respect to x. So in other words, the variable we're using is x. Now it depends what I put there, what you would do here. Likewise here, this notation tells me differentiate y with respect to x. And what it means is get y as the subject and then differentiate. All right, so let's talk about the rules. I'm not going to get too tied up in that yet, but just understand it was caused by these two men not getting on too well and fighting and arguing, and so they each developed their own work. And unfortunately, we as mathematicians need to be able to read the different works and the different schools of mathematics. So usually what happens is there's some kind of agreement that the mathematics community come to, and they stick to that kind of notation. But in actual fact, these three notations are all very powerful in their own right. So let's talk about the rules. The first rule says the following. It says if f of x equals k, k, an element of numbers, reals, then the derivative will be 0. Now you'll say to yourself, well, what does that mean? Well, what that means is if I drew the graph of y equals k, and k was just a number, say it was y equals 5, do you agree with me if it looks sort of like this? What do you know about the gradient of a line like that? Well, the gradient is clearly zero because it's horizontal. Horizontal gradients are always zero. So it makes perfect sense that that's the case. So right, let's go over here and let's look at another way of writing it. I could have written it as the derivative of k. And if I use that notation, I would just go straight away and say zero. So that's option one. Here's option two. And option three is I would say y is equal to k then dy dx equals 0. So I'll try to use the notations as much as possible so you get comfortable with them and you start to realize they're not a big problem. Unfortunately, we cannot predict which one will be used in your exam papers and certainly in, in your future career in mathematics, who knows what uh, text you'll be reading, what schools of mathematics you'll be exposed to, so you really, really need to know them all. Right, let's look at the second rule. The second rule is perhaps the most useful. It says if f of x equals x to the power n, then f dashed x is equal to n x to the n minus 1. Now, you might have seen when I was busy explaining the first principles to you, I mentioned that that was how we did it. And we're going to see now examples shortly, but that's your first notation. Your second notation, if I said the derivative of x to the n, like that, then you would just answer n x to the n minus 1. I'm going to do quite a lot with you, so you're going to get quite good at this. The last notation, if I had this, then you would write dy dx is n x to the n minus 1. I know my students often ask me, doesn't matter if we change our notation, and the answer is no. Clearly it's not a problem. But I find it's best to work with the notation they give you because often it is the more effective one to use. Not always, and where you have to introduce your own, you introduce the one you're comfortable with. But if they're giving it to you, it's usually the better one, and especially when they ask you the rules questions, which are also considered like a kind of theory question, they want to expose you, and sometimes you'll find they'll give you three, one of each kind of rule. So just be careful of that. Let's have a look at the next one. The third rule says if I have f of x, equals k x to the n. So in other words, there's a number we're timesing by in the front. Well, then f dashed of x will equal, let's just get this down a little bit, it will equal k times x to the, oh no, that was nearly a mistake, sorry, just wipe that out, n 
x to the n minus 1. So notice it still has the same format it had here, but you now times it by the number in front. Okay, again, if I have this notation, it's going to be k times the derivative of x to the n, which is equal to k times n x to the n minus 1. So, you know, it's also fine, not a problem. So there was the 1, there was the other, and then this y equals k x to the n means that dy dx is k n x to the n minus 1. Okay, so there are your three notations for that. Now your fourth and fifth rule I'm going to meld into one. And I'm only going to do one of the notations because it's the easiest one to show to you. Basically what it says is if we've got two things added or subtracted to each other and we're asked to differentiate them, then we're entitled to differentiate the one and then add it to the derivative of the second one. So in other words, we would do them separate. Now, of course, these rules don't mean very much until you see them in action. And what I would like to say is you actually can prove these rules using first principles. Again, I don't think there's any need for us to do that at this stage. I'd rather let us move on and do some examples and show you how it works. All right, let's look at the examples. Determine the derivative of each of the following. Now, you might notice I haven't given you a notation to use, but by doing this, I've sort of set the, the tone. So in other words, if I want the derivative of this, I want f dashed x. Now we know that if there are two things being added according to my rule, I can do one and then do the other and just put them together. So let's do that. So I'm going to look at this one here and remember the rule goes as follows. It says, leave the number in front alone, bring this exponent in front, so it's 2, and reduce this exponent by 1. That's to the 1. So the rule says put the 4 down, bring the 1 in front, and reduce that exponent by 1. Now you see I'm writing out all the step here, and you might say to me, well, why are you doing that to us? I'm just showing you so you can see what I'm doing, but in actual fact you don't have to show that step. And I would suggest when you get more comfortable, you don't show that step, because all it does is make your work very cluttered and hard to read. Right, so over here we go over here and we say it's minus 2x. What do I know about 2 minus 1? 2 minus 1 is 1. Over here I've got 4. And what do I know about 1 minus 1? It's 0. Now, of course, do we write the power 1? No, we don't. And do we write x to the 0? No, we don't, because we know that x to the 0, in fact, that I shouldn't have put on again, we know that x to the 0 is actually 1. Anything to the 0 is 1. So we lose that altogether. So ideally, I'd like you to head straight here eventually. Um, these kind of questions are asked and usually about two or three marks, usually a mark for each of the differentiation steps that you had to do. So definitely this one would be two marks, one for this one and one for that one. Right, let's look at the second one. The second one I've said y equals. Now, you might notice in the first one we did, there was only adding and basically subtracting involved. And then there was these little forms that we've been working with in the rules. Here as well, we've got x minus 2, x to the minus 1. So because it was given in this form, I'm going to go dy dx. Now the rule says to me, there was an exponent of 1 there, so let's bring it in front. And let's reduce this by 1. Here I have minus 2, so let's bring this minus 1 in front. And let's reduce it by 1. Now I know that 1 minus 1 is 0, and anything to the 0 is 1. Minus 1 times minus 2 is plus 2, and this is going to be x to the minus 2. Okay, this gets a little bit more hairy. Now, sometimes they'll say to you in a question, write your answers without negative exponents. Now, if they do that, you've got to take this one step further. If they say nothing, it's fine. You can leave it anywhere, but they will on occasion tell you, write without negative exponents. So let's have a look how we would do that. Let's take another color pen. How would we do that? Well, we'd say it's equal to 1 plus. Now, what do we know about a negative exponent? Well, from exponents, we know it drops to the bottom as a positive exponent. And so that is how that would look. All right, let's look at the next one. Now, this next one I've deliberately made a little bit harder in the sense that we have to worry about how we are going to deal with this. So let's look. 
we've got this y equals. Now, first of all, that notation is not conducive to using the rules. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change it. And I'm sure you remember your exponent rule that looks like this. It says, if I have the nth root of x to the m, I may write x to the m over n. So that means it's going to become x to the 4 over 3. My 3 isn't doing too well there, so let's just write it again. 4 over 3. And then here, I must never have a variable in the denominator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this a half, and I'm going to separate out this x to the minus 2. Now, there are other versions of this, but I really recommend this strongly. It makes a huge difference if you do it like this. It's just so much easier to work with. Right, so now we go for dy dx. Since it was given to me in y form, I've decided to use that notation. And the rule says, bring this exponent to the front. So 4 thirds comes to the front. I write my x and I subtract 1 from that. So 4 thirds minus 1 is 1 third. Here, I take minus 2 times minus a half. So I'm going to get plus 1. You can write the 1 or not. x to the minus 3, because it's minus 2 minus 1. And that would be fine. If they said return it to the form it was given in, you would then do the following. You'd say it's 4 thirds, the cube root of x. And here you would return this to 1 over x cubed. But if nothing was said, certainly don't waste your time going here. It depends what the question said to you. All right, so what have I stressed? I've stressed that it's extremely important that we always flatten the actual thing we're going to find the derivative of. Later on, if you go to university and you do mathematics, they will teach you something called product, quotient, and chain rule. Now, the ones you get given at school are far too easy to use those rules. Those rules are designed for much more complex differentiation. So if you have heard of them and you've seen your friends that have gone on to university or whatever show you these things, just remember that the school ones are not designed for that. We really have a really straightforward idea of working with derivative. Right, so let's look at this question. This has got division. Now, I said to you, we must flatten it. To flatten this, working with negative exponents would not be a good idea. But what I could do is I could see if I could factorize that. And yes, I could. That would become x minus 3, x plus 1 over x plus 1. So right, that x plus 1 will divide into that x plus 1, and so I've got y equals x minus 3. I'd now say, OK, what is the derivative of that? So d y dx of that would mean that that's a 1, so the 1 would come in front. Remember, you're reducing that by 1, so it'll be x to the naught. And this is a number, so it'll just fall away. So the answer is 1. Now, remember what I said to you. I said, that is the gradient. Now, if you look at the thing you had there, the x minus 3, isn't the gradient of a graph that says y equals x minus 3, 1? It is. So it's not doing something different. It's doing something exactly the same. OK, so right, let's move on now and develop it a bit further. Right, I was talking about notation, and I just want to spend a few seconds talking to you about where the danger zone is here. Some of the common mistakes that happen. The f of x notation, as I say, the only mistake I've ever seen with that is where somebody sees this and thinks it's an inverse, and it's not. It's actually a derivative. That's really got very little problem areas. But this one over here. The problem is that people are inclined to put the equal sign in the wrong spot. So you will see things like this happen, which is pure nonsense, OK? So be very careful of that. And then the other notation, the dy dx, you might see people write it like this, which is the same thing, OK? And they could even go as far as doing this to it. Remember what I told you about f of x. Or they could write it as d of f of x over dx. So these notations are all important. And again, it's this two mark penalty if you don't get your notations right. I think yeah, it's probably one mark penalty. But you know what? Work on the premise that it's going to be two marks and make sure you don't make the mistake. Because it's not worth losing marks on this. So as I go, I'm going to be very careful how I set it out. And believe me, I'm not doing it for my health. I'm very, very healthy as it is. I don't need to work on that. 
So basically, I'm doing this for your benefit. I'm actually setting it all up thoroughly. And it is something that examiners are strict on. They want good notation, and they will penalize you if you don't do that. So let's go on now and see what's next. Right, let's look at this one. And you can see I've already put the notation in, and you can see it's that third notation where this y, the actual equation, has been written in. Now, if I can give you some guidelines, the first step always is to see what your variable will be. So in this case, they're asking you to differentiate with respect to x. So it's telling me differentiate with respect to x. It's telling you to use this equation. But we know we can have no multiplication, division, or raising to powers on brackets. So now this one here, we don't have raising to powers on the brackets. We do have division and we do have a third sign and also no thirds. So those must go, they cannot stay. Right, so then, in the light of that, the next thing we would do is we would flatten the equation. By that, I mean no variables in the denominator. Right, so let's go over here and see what we're going to do. Now notice it's d by dx of that. I'm not ready to do it yet, so I keep the d by dx there. The equals goes to the left of the sign, and what I'm going to do now is simplify this into a form where I can actually differentiate. So it becomes 2. The root of x becomes x to the half. This becomes plus 2, and that's going to become x to the minus 1. Right, so once we're here, we're ready to go. So now we have flattened it, and now we just apply rules. Right, so here we're going to go. Now, the moment I start to do it, this drops. Now, very careful here. Sometimes what happens is people will do the first one and then still have to tidy up the second one. And in doing that, they actually lose marks because you can't do part of it. Once you take that sign away, that d by dx, you've got to actually differentiate it. So let's do it. So we're going to say a half times 2. Let me show you the steps so that you can see clearly what I'm doing. Remember I talked about how we don't affect that number in front. It just sort of stays there. So this is a half minus 1. Oh, I keep doing this with my minus 1. I've obviously decided it doesn't, I don't feel like lifting my pen. Right, over here, the black part, the plus 2, will stay as is. And the derivative part will be this part where I'm going to say minus 1, x to the minus 1, minus 1. Now, as I say, this step is not necessary to show. It's really your choice, and I would suggest to start you do it. But eventually, it actually doesn't really help you to quite write that in. So now I would actually do the actual work. So 2 times a half is 1. And if I take a half minus 1, I'm going to get minus a half. Yeah, this is going to be minus 2. And this is going to be x to the minus 2. Now I'm finished, unless the question said to me, write without negative or turn it to the form it was in previously or something like that. But I think at this stage we'll leave it there because I haven't really left more space to work with it. So that's great, and I think you can see it's relatively easy. Notice again, while I was flattening, the derivative stayed. Once I do it, the derivative falls away. All right, let's look at the next one. Now, remember what I said to you. The first thing we do is we see what we are interested in. We want to differentiate with respect to x, but we want to get y on its own. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get y on its own here. So I'm going to say y will equal 3x squared plus 4x plus 1 divided by x plus 1. Then the next thing I'd do is I'd have to flatten it. Now notice I'm not even using this notation yet because I'm still at the stage where I'm flattening and making it easier. So over here I look and I say, well, this becomes, let's factorize it because it's a quadratic, Let's put a 3x there and an x there. 
and a 1 and a 1. This tells me sine's the same. This tells me both positives. Yes, that'll work over x plus 1. And yes, that's good news because the x plus 1's divide out. Now, at school level, this will happen mostly when you have a binomial denominator. I really doubt you would get something worse than that. But if you did, it would just involve factorizing and cancelling down as much as possible. Right, so let's go over here. So what have we got? We've now got, let's make sure I'm in another color pen, y is equal to 3x plus 1. Remember what I said to you? That is asking for the gradient. And we know the gradient will be 3, but let's be good. At this stage, I go dy, dx. And I look at this and I say that's to the power 1. 1 times 3 is 3. That's x to the naught, which we don't bother writing. And the derivative of a constant is 0. So there's my answer. Right, let's look at the next one. Back to this previous notation. I deliberately have chosen this because there's a little bit of a complication here. Not major, just a little bit. Remember what I said to you. The first thing we do is we look and we see what variable we're working in. We are working in x. But there's an x in the denominator. And we know if there's an x in the denominator, we have a problem. So we must flatten our thing before we actually start working. So now there's several ways to do it. And I've seen people do some strange and weird and wonderful things with exponents and negative exponents. But I know from my pupil's point of view, exponents are never considered an easy section for them. So I try to make it as simple as possible. And to do that, I go back to grade 9 level mathematics. So let's have a look what I do. I would look at this and I'd say, right, well, I'm not going to do this yet because I need to make things simpler. But what I can do here is I can say 2x squared and I can divide it by root x, which could be better written as x to the half. Then I could have x to the half divided by x to the half. And then I could have 4 divided by x to the half. OK, I will show you the alternative to this. And I really think you would agree with me this is easier. So the rule says if it's a monomial, one term at the bottom, I divide it individually into each one of these. Right, so still not ready to do my actual differentiation. So over here I look and the 2 is going to do nothing, but I know that this is division. And the rule says take the top exponent and subtract the bottom exponent. So it's x to the 1 and a half. And just for convenience, I'm going to write it as 3 over 2 because it's neater and easier to work with. This will divide exactly into their 1s. And this I need to have this out of the denominator, so I'm going to write it as 4x to the minus a half. Right, the question is, have I flattened it now? Yes, most definitely. So at this stage, I can actually do the derivative. So ready to do the derivative now, I drop this, and I say 3 over 2 times 2 is going to be 3. x to the 3 over 2 minus 1, which will just be a half. The derivative of 1 is 0, and I could write plus 0 if I wanted to. And the derivative of this is 4 times negative a half, which is minus 2. x to the minus a half minus 1, which is minus 3 over 2. Perfectly all right, and yes, they say to me, write without negative exponents. Okay, so you're getting the idea of this, I'm sure, by now, and you're starting to feel comfortable with it. And it's a really nice section. Let's have a look at how I put the marks in for this, just for a matter of interest, so you can see for yourself. First thing I would have done is probably given you a mark, a mark, a mark, a mark, and a mark. So probably about five marks there. At very worst, I would probably have given you four for that. All right, let's look at this one. And I can see that my one little notation here has sort of slipped down. So let's just bring him up so he's in the right spot. All right, so now it says if x squared is equal to 20x minus 4k, remember the first thing I said to you is look at what variable you're working in. You're working in x. What are they telling you must be the subject of the formula? They're telling you k must be the subject of the formula. So here is k. So let's bring the 4k this side. Let's bring the x squared this side. Then let's divide everything by 4. So 4 into 20 goes 5 times. And this is going to be minus a quarter x squared. Now there's nothing wrong with writing x squared over 4. But I always like to separate my number from my x. Not wrong if you don't do it, as I say. So what is dk dx now? Well, let's see what happens. What happens now is I say that is going to be the derivative of that is 5. 2 times a quarter is a half. x to the power 1, and I don't have to write the 1. So relatively straightforward, not a problem. Let's look at the last one on this page. 
and see what that says. And again, I think my, my exponents, my equations have all got a little bit carried away. I think they are punch drunk and they are falling down. Now, this one involves multiplication. Now, remember what I said to you right in the beginning. I said, whatever you do, you can't work with multiplication, division, or raising to powers. So what we're going to do here is we first of all going to say we're working with a variable x, and we are going to multiply out that thing. So we're going to get x cubed minus 2x, close the bracket. Now, at this stage, this thing's ready to go because there's no funny stuff going on there. It's a nice flat equation. So we can say it's 3x squared minus 2. And that's my equation there. Beautifully done. Right, now let's look at two more examples. And then basically at that stage, I think we've got this section under control. Um, now, basically, we must say to you, it's very important that you separate your numbers from your variables. And you must never have a variable in the denominator. So let's have a look at this first example here. It's beautiful for that. So if we have a look at this, we have y equals. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say this can become a half x cubed. And this is going to become minus 2x to the minus 1. Remember, taking the x up and separating the half out. Now at this stage, I'm ready to do my derivative. So at this stage, I'll go dy dx. And I'll now do it. So I'll say 3 times a half is 3 over 2 x to the 2, and now I'm going to times that over here, so I'm going to have plus 2 x to the minus 2. Question finished. Now the last one we're going to look at is this one over here, where we're working with a derivative in this notation. But it really doesn't matter, remember what I've said to you, we may not have a variable at the bottom. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, ah, oh, it's a binomial, well let's hope that this factorizes and something cancels. So if I look at this, I can say that this is x and x, and the factors of 8 would be 4 and 2. I would like a plus on the 4 and a minus on the 2, and I see I'm actually very fortunate because, again, it's doing just what I said it would do. That is cancelling with that. And so I'm getting f of x equal to x plus 4. All right, let's lift this up slightly. Now, if we look at the derivative of x, we can see that that would be 1. And of course, we know that because we look at that, that's a straight line, its gradient would be 1. So that then brings us to the end of the session. I would have liked to have touched on our tangent, but we'll start our next section by looking at, well, not immediately, but pretty shortly in the next session, we will start by looking at how we find the equation of a tangent to a curve. Now, I've really enjoyed being with you, and I hope you've enjoyed learning the basics. And now we're ready to get down to business and enjoy working with calculus. Thank you very much.